we're going to talk today about the anatomy of a commercial irrigation system. Uh, we could actually strike the word commercial. I, I, the anatomy of the irrigation system. Irrigation systems are basically the same, whether they're commercial or residential. Um, commercial systems, the difference would be that the parts are bigger and that This is worth right? Up. Oh, good. No, it's still still not working. Okay, you can hear it now. Great. So we'll let Mike talk and I'll just <laughs> So anyway, with commercial irrigation systems, the the parts are bigger and um, they're probably more sustainable. Um, I wanted to we I always like to start with a couple of definitions because we um, talk about things, and we heard this morning about ET, reference ET, adjusted ET. What does all that mean? That all goes part of the design process, but what you need to know, ETO, or reference ET, is just how much water in inches a cool season turf grass needs that's well watered mode at four to seven inches. And they measure that, and that so then everything is referenced off of that. Dave, I'm sorry. I've got to make one other announcement. Um, the actual presentation that you have in your notebook, in your binder, will be different because uh, I inadvertently put the uh, preceding version in there. So you can use take your notes, and we'll have this presentation in its entirety on our website, ToroWaterSmart.com. So if some of you were saying, "Hey, that's not the first slide in my," I wanted to explain that, so apologize for that, but go ahead and take notes, and uh, we'll get you that on our website. That took 37 seconds for him to okay. tell you that. <laughs> uh, and then we have evapotranspiration, and, and that's the amount of water that's used by a specific plant that's either evaporated or transpired, uh, transpired through the plant itself. And then we have the ET adjustment factor, and this is what we're all using in order to schedule our irrigation systems. And it takes a variety of things. It takes the reference ET, it takes the plant factor of the species that you're trying to irrigate, and then we have to apply uh, an irrigation efficiency factor. So you have those three things, they all sound the same, but they're all a little bit different, and I thought you should probably know about that. A plant factor or crop coefficient is different for different species of plant. Turf grass has a, uh, an annual ET value of, or uh, excuse me, pro a crop coefficient value of approximately 0.8 for cool season turf, um, but it varies throughout the year. So you need to know what that is and you can adjust your irrigation systems accordingly. And low water using plants might only have a plant factor of 0.3. And what that all means when we look back at the ET is if we t take that plant factor and multiply the reference ET by the 0.3, that's what the ET is for that plant. Um, and then we have hydrozones, and these are when we plant like plants within a, a grouping. So turf grass would be a hydrozone, um, but not all turf grass is a hydrozone because if some of the turf grass is in shade, that's a different hydrozone than the turf grass in sun. So all of those things need to be considered in, in your irrigation system. And irrigation efficiency um, is when we measure the, um, the use of uh, how the water is applied to an irrigation device, such as a sprinkler. And then we they come up with things like uh, SC, CU, DU, and you go, what does all that mean? SC, scheduling coefficient. CU, coefficient of uniformity. DU, distribution uniformity. And all that boils down into the formulas that the, you see in uh, 1881, and, uh, which is now the ET adjustment factor, uh, or the ET irrigation efficiency is required to be at 0.71. That doesn't mean it is. Could be lower, could be higher. And my favorite is, we, we, we need to know what landscape is. And in my definition of landscape is an array of various plant materials selectively picked and appropriately placed to enhance and beautify the irrigation system. So as long as we're cool with that, that's what we're going to go on to. We need to, to, I'm going to talk a little bit about all the components within an irrigation system. And efficient irrigation, sis, irrigation 
starts with all of us. We all have to participate in it. And the elements that are make up an irrigation system are design, installation, product, maintenance, and management. And in order to do a design, we have to gather information about the project that we're going to design. Um, and uh, that takes people. We need to determine the water meters and the service line size where the, uh, and how much water is available to us. Is the water domestic or reclaimed? Those are things we want to know as a designer when we're starting to put together our design. We need to know what the water pressure is. You can go out and record the water pressure, especially if you have existing irrigation. Do you have sufficient irrigation system for your sprinkler system to operate at its optimum efficiency? And if it doesn't, if it's too low, you need to add pumps. If it's too high, you need to add regulators. So it's a real important thing. And you, if, you don't, if you can't measure it, you're doing a new project, you can call the water district and get the information from them. And why is it important to know about water pressure? I mentioned low, too, water pressure too low, too high. Well, if the water pressure is too high, have you ever seen this out on watching your sprinklers go on and there's a big fog bank coming up? Pressure's too high on those sprinklers. If it's too low, you end up with uh, landscapes that look like this. What you want is an even color. Um, even if it's browning out, you want that brown to be the same shade across the landscape. So if we're reducing our water, we, we might get that. But we, we want the water pressure to be just right so that the sprinklers operate at the, at the intent of what the manufacturers say that it should operate at. Things we need to know, and Fiona talked a little bit about this, about the landscape. We need to know what kind of landscape. Is it turf? Is it cool season turf? Is it warm season turf? Is it a moderate using plant? Is it low water using plant? And we need to know what the square footage of that plant is so that you can actually calculate how much water you should budget for your landscape. And there's formulas to do that. We need to know what our sprinkler head precipitation rate is, and we need to know our daily run times or cycle times. The reason that we need to know that is we need to create a water window. Will your irrigation system work within the water window that you're allocated? If you're using recycled water, it might, your wa recycled uh, water window, I think in Irvine Ranch is nine hours. Is that right, Nick? Nine hours. So if, you, if you're applying the right amount of water and it takes you 12 hours and 50 minutes to irrigate your landscape, then you have a problem. So, you, so in the, that might be a problem for an old project, but for a new project, you've got to take those things into consideration uh, for your design. One of the areas that are the biggest problems that we see are soils. And everybody says, oh, my landscape's not doing well. The sprinkler system must be bad. It's not necessarily so. It's, there's soils, and you need to know about your soils, what kind of soil you have. Um, each kind of sand gets irrigated differently than uh, clays. Sand, you might have to irrigate your turf every day. Clay, you might only have to irrigate your turf once a week. So, and all of these things affect how the irrigation schedule is going to be set up. So soil is real critical and you need to know about it in terms of the design and management. Did I go the wrong way? Ah, this, we're gonna, now we're going to get into what an irrigation system is. We start with a, a water source. In this particular example, this is um, a non-domestic water source, but it's not a recycled water source. So that's why this unit is painted green instead of purple. Uh, if we're using recycled, we would have painted this purple. And from the water source, we go into a uh, gate valve so we can shut off the water source. We have a Y strainer so we can protect the irrigation system from any external rock, debris that might be coming from our source. And in this particular case, it was from a lake. Um, and then we go into a master valve. And the master valve 
is a, a device that can, uh, if you have a problem downstream and you need to shut the system off in an emergency or something for a break or what have you, that master valve can be activated to shut down. And how does it know how to be activated? Here we have a flow sensor that manages and tells how much, you tell the system how much water you are going to allow through it. If you exceed that, it sends a signal back, or if there's too little water, it sends a signal back, shuts down the master valve. And if you're using a central control system, you will end up with information on your computer the next day. So that's how we're getting water to our system. And then our, our system's managed by an irrigation controller. It could be a smart controller, could be a timer, could be a central control system. So as a part of the installation of that, this is what we would like to see. We don't want to see this. You need to, uh, you know, if your contractor's doing this to you, you need to have a little talk with them. So I wanted to show you that there's, there's the situations where what you want and what you don't want. This particular is a central control system. There's a number of controls lined up. So you, you can have a central control or you can have a smart control central system or you can have individual timers depending on the size of your system. If like you're talking about your HOA in Anaheim and you've got 100 acres, you're probably interested in having a smart control system that can be managed through a, a, a central system. Then from our controller, we're, we're managing, contr oops, I'm gonna go back. We're managing, it, water's going to a control valve. Now the control valve controls how the sprinklers, the, 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 the controller system is managing how long that valve will t tie on. And we're tying that valve through a system of wires back to the controller so we can activate the valve when the control system says it's time to activate it or shut it off. And we connect all these things with pipes. And hopefully, your contractor is laying pipe in the ground like this, so when you have to maintain it or manage it, it looks something like this, as opposed to this. Because it's very hard to fix this piece of pipe that's running under here when it broke right at that spot because these two pipes now have been running to, rubbing together for the last five years. So you need, to, you need to watch that when the system's being installed and that you're using proper materials and they're, they're installed in accordance with the design requirements, plans and specifications. And we have emission devices, sprinklers. They can be a, a, a myriad of, of devices, drip emitters, inline drip, uh, stream rotors such as this. Uh, big rotors, golf rotors, and, and we also have sprays and uh, bubblers, spray head, bubblers. The key is to put the water from the emission devices, such as sprinklers, to where the landscape is. And that's key in, uh, in, in, in the design itself. We're trying to do that. We're trying to say, well, this is the kind of landscape we have. This is the kind of sprinkler that we should, should use. We've got a big, open, expansive turf area. We're going to use large rotors. We have tight little shrub areas, we're small areas. We're going to use sprays. Or even smaller, we're going to use um, bubblers. Or we're going to use a drip system. Any of these are acceptable if they, as long as they don't do two things, as long as you don't create runoff, and as long as you don't create overspray. And then, so you're meeting the intent of Assembly Bill 1881. Climate is a big problem. It's something you can't control, an exposure. Um, do you turn on your system when the wind's blowing 40 miles an hour? This street is going to be well washed by tomorrow morning. And the landscape, as you can see right here, is dry. So, and, and what happens is when we have winds like this, the ET goes up. So the landscape actually needs a little more water and we're not applying it to it. And then you come out the next day and you go, my landscape's dying, I'm a, I gotta turn up the water. 
So we need to look at climate and exposures. Exposure, you probably never think about this. If you, if you were designing a landscape around a building and the building was glass, you would think that the western and southern exposures with the sun beating off of it all day is going to be really hot. And that would need more water than, say, the back of the building that's facing north that's shady all day and doesn't get any sun directly off of it. So those are two identical landscapes, but needing drastically different amounts of water. And you need to take that into consideration in the design. You don't design an irrigation system that goes all around the building. Uh, you design it around for the various exposures. Um, and you don't, um, and you need to adjust your irrigation schedule for the landscape that you have. Maintenance and management. If the pressure's wrong, the spacing of the sprinkler's wrong, you could end up with a landscape that looks like this, and that's not very appealing. Other things, we're watering the street again. You know, if the sprinklers aren't adjusted properly, they're watering in the street. Or if they're allowed to run too long, they're over. They're running off and down over the curb and down the street. And my favorite is, you guys, it's really easy to find a broken sprinkler head. So <laughs> go out and look for it. And when you find it, fix it. This is nothing but wasting water. Yeah, it's a big sprinkler. So the, the things that um, we have to have is a good design. We have to have a proper installation. We have to have effective management of the system and regular maintenance. And you know, when we talk about the important things of real estate, everybody says it's location, location, location. When I think of an irrigation system, the most important thing and the thing that doesn't happen all the time is management, management, management. And if you, if you have your management under control and you had a proper design and you had a proper installation and you have proper ma maintenance, you'll be able to meet the, the rules and criteria that's set forth by Assembly Bill 1881. I also belong to the American Society of Irrigation Consultants, um, which I like to give a plug to. Uh, if you're in need of an irrigation consultant, we're a, a national organization. You can go to asic.org, and if I'm assuming all of you are from Southern, uh, from California here, you can go to that website and find a consultant in your area. And I, I would encourage you to do that. And I'm Dave Pagano. I'm an irrigation consultant. I do.